All right, before I introduce our panel moderator, I want to share some fun FITC, FITC tidbits about our panelists. Josh Davis couldn't make it to the very first FITC Toronto event, and so he agreed to fly up a month before and do a talk at the Bloor Theatre with us, making him our first ever FITC speaker. He has spoken at 22 FITC events across 11 cities over the years. G Monk first spoke with FITC in 2005 and has since spoken over 25 times with FITC, including New York City, San Francisco, Tokyo, Amsterdam, and Winnipeg. Beeple has been with FITC since 2015 and has since spoken at several shows and has designed the event creative and titles for FITC Toronto in 2019. Moderating this panel is the incomparable Lady Phoenix, a, late, a leading voice for contemporary digital art and culture, providing an essential platform for the art and artists of our time and a passionate producer of creative works at the intersection of art and technology. She is a guest lecturer at Harvard and Dartmouth, teaching the foundations of crypto media and NFTs. She is the co-author of the forthcoming book, Freedom Dreams in the Open Metaverse, and recently founded Museum of the Digital Diaspora located in the Crypto Voxels Metaverse. Please welcome Lady Phoenix. I'm yeah. super excited to be here. Uh, what's up, G Monk? What's up, Josh? What's up, people? What How are you guys up, doing? What up? What up? How are we doing? <laughs> good to see you, Lady Fee. Yeah, good to see you all too. Josh, is it true you've actually really done? I mean, he just said it, but have you really done all twenty? Like that's pretty nuts. Yeah, I think for the for the Canadian edition, yeah, I, th I think I've spoken at at all of them. Uh, obviously, they've done some international ones that I've missed. But even then, I've I've done a lot of the international ones. So yeah, I'm a I'm the I'm the old guy. I'm the token old guy. <laughs> no, you're the o, you're the OG. You're the OG, OG, not the old guy, but the real OG. Yeah, the original, the prime, the one of one. The so prime. what is um what why have you come to all these events to to speak? What does this community mean to you, Josh? Yeah, you're muted, brother. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I think it's like, for me, it's, it's kind of a form of promotion, right? So, you know, like I personally only do like one or two, three projects a year and the rest of the time I'm kind of inventing stuff here in my studio. And so going to these kind of events is a way to sort of hang out with, you know, friends that I've made over the years, as well as kind of show a lot of this experimental stuff that, that later will, you know, become more public. So I think it's a platform to sort of share where you want to be rather than where you've already been to, you know? Hmm. How about you, Bradley, G Monk? You've been, you've been at almost all of them as well. What does this community means, mean to you? I think it's twofold. One, it's a way to reconnect with dear friends and collaborators and industry peers. I, you know, the time that we've spent uh, all of us through the years together at conferences is just the memories and just the time together, the face time together uh, is, you know, you just don't get that opportunity to connect with such talented, lovely people um, very much. So that that's always great. And I love seeing other speeches, you know, to recharge, get inspired from other great artists. Um, and then it's just, it's a, it's a holiday. I usually take my wife and we go on adventures to South America, to Europe, to Tokyo, to all over the world, Amsterdam, Canada. So it's, it's just, it's the conference circuit's kind of the best. It's where a lot of big breaks in my career has happened. And, and I've gotten to know all these lovely people. So talk about one of the biggest breaks, the thing that was most memorable for you through your relationship with FITC? It was a good one. Uh, it was uh, early morning, I was very hungover, and I was on a panel <laughs> with uh, Joseph Kaczynski, uh, Angus Neal, and Brendan Dawes. And we were talking about you know, the future of creativity, and Joseph Kaczynski is a feature filmmaker. Um, at the time, was, was transitioning from commercials to his first feature film, that was Tron Legacy. 
And we knew each other when we both lived in New York, but never collaborated. And we met on the panel and we started talking and we started talking about uh, my motion design work. And at that panel, he basically scheduled an interview for me to come in and interview to design all the holograms in his first feature film, Tron Legacy. And if it wasn't for the panel and meeting him and connecting with him, I probably wouldn't have had that big break. And that was a huge transition in my career from commercial work to feature film work. So Amazing. Big, Congratulations yeah, on crazy. that. That is yeah. crazy. That's super crazy. How yeah. about you, Mike? Uh, just what do I, th or like sort of why do I come out to the events? Yeah, like what's your connection with the FITC community and why is this important to you as an artist? Yeah, so the first one I did was um, actually suggested to Ash um, for uh, FITC 2015, I think. Um, and so since then, I've probably done another like four or five or something like that, uh, just because it's so fun. And it, just like G-Monk was saying, like, you become like super good friends with the people because you spend like three, four days, like, you know, all day with these people. And so you really get to know people and, and it's all the things you're saying. It's a break, it's a recharge, it's a networking thing. Like you'll meet so many like inspiring people and like everybody's working on such cool different things. So many things too that you will it's so broad it, it's not so narrow that it's like everybody's doing the exact same thing like there's people doing things wildly different than you but there's still some through line to be like okay yeah i understand this program or i use like this technique or something so it's just such a uh like melting pot of of just crazy ideas and just like energy and, and just like you will go back from it feeling recharged and just sort of you know ready to fucking smash some shit so speaking of connections and friendships, did you, did the three of you meet at FITC or? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I definitely G-Monk. I'm pretty sure Joshua Davis, I'm pretty sure that was the first time. Amsterdam. I'm say in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time we met in person, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was definitely like, you know, right there is sort of like, these are two people that it was like, I was super familiar with their work and like huge fans, especially Joshua Davis. Like I was definitely like, hugely influential on me, you know, like coming up as, as a designer. So and to be able to like meet them through this event, you know, was extra like super cool and like, you know, see them through this context. And yeah, it's definitely just, uh, Sean is, is created such a like amazing community of people who are all just like super passionate, super cool. Like everybody's just super friendly. It's not like, there's no drama. There's no like bullshit. It's just like always like a, just a good time. And like, a great sort of like refresh. And for those playing cursing bingo at home, <laughs> it's Beeple with the first F-bomb. <laughs> I did? What did I say? <laughs> I think it's just normal, you know, <laughs> semantics. <laughs> That's fair. That's Beeple's fair. first talk at FITC was so good. So such a classic talk. It was like 15 slides maybe like one one piece of work and just bullet point lists of just him swearing about how uncomfortable he is. And he brought Ash on stage with him as moral support. It was literally one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And G um, was literally in the first row, like 10 feet away, just like asking questions. Firing questions. Like, one thing, like question, <laughs> question. <laughs> Which actually really helped. Like, I feel like that actually really so helped good. a lot. It was, it was so like, good. Just answer this. <laughs> Can you remember, uh, G-Monk, a specific question that you asked that really uh, sort of broke the ice or uh, made it, it extra memorable for you? I don't remember you. what the questions were now that you say that. I mean, I think I was just, I was actually trying to help him and just trying to, like, dig into his process more, you yeah, know, and just, like... Questions. Yeah, ask, I was actually, it questions. was actually not, yeah, I was not trying ask to fuck with them. I was trying to no. like get him to dig deeper into his process. No, they're actually so let's really do good that. questions. Let's do that. G-Monk, ask him one of those uh, deep uh, questions now, digging into his Seriously. process. Dig into the process. Dig into the process. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think the thing that blows me away about Mike is just all of the work he does is done in a day. And literally for a decade, I've always been encouraging him to spend more time on his pieces. And he's never listened to me. And the result of this <laughs> is that he's so, he's literally so good at this point that he's designing work done in a day that people would spend a month on. And I think that's kind of 
the point of his every days is to just get so good at the process that it's just, you know, like people look at the work and they're just, you know, they're like, holy shit, this is amazing. Oh, and by the way, this is done in three hours. And it's just like becomes even more fucked up. Um, so at this point, you know, I kind of, I just think like, what's the, what's the goal now, man? Where do you go now, people? We'll see. Spring collection, baby. <laughs> I'm here to pump my drop. Now I get to freaking be the one. Oh, yeah. I get a drop. The, uh, no, let's dude, talk about I appreciate it. Let's talk about it, Mike. What's your drop? What's up? Oh, um, what's the drop? The drop is on Nifty on uh, the 30th. It's like what we've been working for. And to your point, I appreciate all those kind words. Like, I feel like there's definitely a lot more room to like push. Like, I feel like we're just at the beginning of something here with this NFT stuff that I think is just such a massive opportunity. Everybody on this call has like, you don't have to like preach in the choir here, like, you know, has seen the power of this and seen the like opportunity there. And I think is just so excited to see this thing that we've been immersed in for the last 20 years suddenly looked at by the world in a completely different light. It's like, whoa, it's, and it's a way better light too. It's like, wow, this is fucking great. Like, what are we? But that's so know, funny because is. that's one of my gripes is that it's called crypto art. And, nah. and well, yeah, see, I feel like I love this because I remember seeing Mike somewhere. It was just like, no, nah, man, it's not crypto art. It's digital art. And we've been doing it for like 26 years. <laughs> I think some of it is crypto art, but I think a lot of the way that and again, everybody's got their own. There's no right, you know, this or that. Like to me though, it's sort of like, unless you're using the crypto piece of it in a sort of like interesting, unique way, or it's themed crypto, that to me is crypto art. The rest is just sort of digital art being sold on the blockchain. Like it, it doesn't to me have that much to do with crypto because it's just, again, proof of ownership then. And it's not, you're not really using that proof of ownership sort of mechanism in a, you know, unique, interesting way that utilizes the blockchain or utilizes crypto in a way. Um, but yeah, I think there's still, regardless of, of how you kind of like label it, such a just massive opportunity to, to push things forward. And just also, if, it, if it's able to give creators like you guys the freedom to just not do client work and literally just make art like that alone is massive because that's going to be a lot of people that will be able to sort of like just suddenly just like any other fine artist like make a living just making art and yeah. so i think it's going to be I, i'm super excited for that because you are going to see an explosion of just unique like amazing art just from that facet of this alone and i'm sure lady phoenix has you know an agenda of stuff that we want to talk about Oh, but at sorry. some but at some point like oh. if we can just set the financial stuff aside and just talk about putting you know a catalog of someone's work on the blockchain uh what that means in terms of secondary sales also a state like passing it down to my daughter and then to her family and to their family like there's so much more to this conversation that I think is getting ignored. And, and every time I kind of do these one-on-one -on -one videos with peers of mine who, you know, want feedback or, or advice. And I start talking about these other aspects other than financial, it's always that, oh, sh you know, I never, you know, I never thought about that or, you know, that's making me see it different in a, in a different light. And we can go into bigger detail, but I don't want to derail. That's actually, no, 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 that doesn't derail. That's actually something I would like to, to speak about, right? So, you know, what I was going to say is like, Mike, you know, you 69 million at Christie's is, is pretty impressive by any, you know, any means, any standards, right? How are you thinking about, and then Josh, then G Monk want to pivot into this conversation because Josh, we've spoken about this at length, right? In our, in our private conversations and something as an art advisor um, and as a curator, something I'm always thinking about for the artist is 25, 50, a hundred years into the future, right? A, how are we preserving the work? B, how are we still talking about the work? And C, what does it mean now for your estate, for your legacy, for your family to still have these works in circulation and be, you know, and be talked about, right? Um, I really wish that I could have a conversation with the family of Basquiat to see what they think about this whole process, you know, 40, 50 years after his death, right? Um, 
and sorry if my math is wrong, we're just using numbers here, but you get the point. Um, so why don't we, actually, Josh, why don't you kick it off and then we'll go back to Mike and then to you, uh, G Monk. So tell us some of your thoughts about, cause you're collected by the Whitney, right? You're in their permanent collection. And so you have a daughter and it would be great if your daughter knew and, you know, was it new and was also awarded anything that were to come financially specifically as well through the association of your work being in a permanent collection of a major institution. I think NFTs enable that, but I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts about that and, you know, how you think about your digital uh, legacy and estate as an artist. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll try to make this quick, but it's it's a lot to unpack. Obviously, I watched two documentaries on Netflix. Um, one was about the sale of a Warhol Brillo box. Uh, it was a, uh, it's narrated by a woman who was a child at the time and her father bought the box and she's trying to track down what happened to it. And of course she follows it going from collector to collector, to collector, to collector. The box I think gets bought for like $700. And of course you can see where this is going. The end of the story is it sells at Sotheby's for $3.5 million. So the question is how much did Warhol get? Yeah. That initial 700 bucks. So that idea of, of a baked in you know, secondary sale in perpetuity, I, I'm amazed that more artists aren't freaking out about this, right? And then the second aspect is, you know, there was another documentary I watched, you know, about the Nodler Gallery selling forges, you know, forgeries. So there's that, you know, authentication process where, you know, if I had a Picasso and I wanted to sell that Picasso, I'd have to get that Picasso authenticated that it's not actually a forgery. So there's so much happening with this technology that is in such the benefit for the artist, you know, I almost don't even want to talk about the financial stuff because there's all this other amazing aspects. You know, if somebody were to, uh, you know, I started making work in 1995 and, um, you know, if a book publisher came to me and said, hey, we want to do a retrospective of your work, you know, well, that book would only have so many pages. I would sort of have to weed out, you know, I'd have to not select certain pieces. And then eventually the publisher would say, you know, okay, we got to you know, publish the book. That book would end, but my life would keep going. And so, you know, and then books get lost, you know, they're not a great permanent record. So this idea of this technology coming along that allows anyone to put their life's catalog for a, long foreseeable future and then having collectors being able to then negotiate the collecting of a work and then the ability for me to you know i'm gonna die that's a different panel you know i mean we're all thinking about this so now we've got this public key <laughs> that you know as long as dark. we <laughs> has you know the the login or the seed phrase you know that public key can pass along my family for generations um, and they can all benefit from hopefully, you know, the life's work that I've been doing. They can benefit from the secondary sales. Like to me, that is a much greater conversation than this guy, Mike made $69 million. I'm happy for you, bro. But there is such a larger conversation that I think gets overshadowed by the financial stuff that we really should be shining a light on what this really means for any kind of creative person going forward, whether that's a, a painter, a photographer, a graphic designer, a musician, like this is a monumental shift. Yeah. So how are you? Go ahead, Your point, I, don't know. I think it's, I think it's tough. Like, like some of those things, I think they're important, but I think it's going to be really hard to be quite honest to enforce like royalty type stuff. Cause there's always ways that people want to get around that stuff. It's honestly, I think the only way you would literally be able to enforce it is if it was a law that you had to do it, which is, which is literally my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, the case in Europe, that there is some percentage associated to it, to a work. It's, but I also believe it's capped really like, okay, well, I, I want to say it's capped at like 15,000 or something like that. I don't think you could get millions from this. I, I could be wrong on that too. I might be just like, well, totally you know, talking my ass here. Um, no, no, you bring up a good point, Mike. And, and here's the thing within the crypto art community, right? Uh, around 2017, this was also an issue. 
And they, they basically said, the artists basically said, look guys, if, if we're not gonna get royalties on the secondary market, we're not participating. We're not gonna be on your platforms. We're just gonna do our own things that we've been doing for many years between each other. We actually don't need you as you know the middle person to our process, right? Of, of getting these Very sales, right? And then the platform said, oh, well, this is important to you guys and you won't play ball unless we do this. Well, definitely we support you and we want you to have uh, the royalty. So yes, on all the platforms now, the royalty is there. Is it enforced? Uh, you know, not widely and not as often as it should be. But this is an, op again, this pr presents an opportunity because, you know, before artists weren't getting the royalty of 10%, right? On the secondary market. Should they be getting a little bit more? Heck yes. I think that an artist, if they're with a gallerist or, you know, and if the gallerist is taking 50%, 50 their royalty should be 50%. If the platform is taking 20% on the primary sale as a commission, then that royalty should be 20%, right? Should be commiserate with whatever was removed from the, from the agreement and financially to begin with, right? Why would you only get 10% on the secondary market when I think, you know, in the beginning, you had to split commissions in the form of 20% or more. I think you should bake that commission in and, and get the upside of that. But that's my personal opinion. It um, is, yeah, it is interesting how these <laughs> things are like changing and they're changing very fast and sort of norms are being set of like, okay, what are the, what is sort of like, you know, a reasonable sort of commission and what are, you know, based on historical sort of galleries and stuff like that, you know, it's very interesting to see especially between the different platforms too uh, when you start mixing in the like global auction houses and and stuff like that so it's it's definitely interesting to see how each of these handle it differently and i think it's for me it's definitely been a crazy ride because again as a digital artist i mean these, these guys too it's like nobody was dealing with these like auctions and like any of this crap like collectors rights resale royalties like this wasn't even something on anybody's radar like literally like you know five months ago so it's definitely been a lot to think about but it what i think is encouraging is it it does feel like we have a voice in it and it does feel like it's not just like shouting into like nothing and like there's no way any of this is going to change it feels like there's like we can kind of like shape this thing and everybody's in here sort of like writing the rules of this like together and and sort of you know, pushing forward the, the things that are important to them. Bradley, what is something, sorry, G Monk, what is something that you think about a lot in regards to this? Josh talking about, um, you know, legacy and being able to pass on, you know, the good works of what you've been doing now to, to your children. Mike talking about specifically, how do we reinforce, you know, and make it a law, you know, perhaps that, the, that royalties um, are not optional. Right, that artists will get the royalties no matter what platform it's sold on. So whether it's you know sold at auction at Christie's, you know, or sold you know at Super Rare or Nifty Gateway or any of these other you know platforms. What are your thoughts around the space, and what's something that sort of like maybe keeps you up at night thinking about in terms of NFTs? Well, nothing really keeps me up at night. I'm a great sleeper, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I will I'll, a couple things. <laughs> Um, a couple things. Uh, one is that you know I have a I have a baby boy on the way in August. Oh, this guy! So this you know, guy. just start. Congratulations! To That's amazing. Wait, so much. I didn't know that. Did you? Have, have you been telling people? I didn't know. That. It's been trickling out. You know, I'm not. You know. That's crazy, dude. Congrats, yeah. dude. That's Thanks, fucking man. Oh, Thanks. God. Yeah. So I'm. So I'm. You know, I think that's going to change my life profoundly, and and I'll start thinking about. Wait, when? When? April? Early, early August. Early August. Okay. Got yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, maybe so, your baby oh, yeah. will be born on Barack Obama's birthday. That that's would be amazing. Crazy. I love that. I love and then that. Barack could like pop by the house or something. Oh, That'd be the best <laughs> favorite president ever. Um, you know, so so I am starting to think about legacy, and I think I've I've always you know I've Mike I've, I have a twenty year career, and I've done a lot of different things and a lot of client work, right? And and balancing the client work, I've always tried to dip into the fine art world in the past, you know, and and make my way. And I just realized that it's a full time job to do that. To to dip into the fine art world is literally a full time. Oh yeah. It needs to be 100% or you're not and you're not going to make it. And I just never had the bandwidth to stop doing client work to invest in myself to go into the fine art world. And I think now it's finally you could, you could happening. You could make enough money in it. 
You exactly. Or could you? You could make prints or something, but like people just weren't that interested in buying prints. It was just. It was a really, you really. Know, yeah. Do it. And it's like, but I don't know anybody who was making like, uh, a, a like good, very good living selling prints. To be quite yeah. honest, maybe there's there are. a few people, but it's very, very few. Right. Yeah, I know. If, yeah, yeah, or selling paintings or something. But it it just was always a really, uh, you know, tough world to get into, and so. Um, you know, now I'm finding that I can say no to 80% of client work to focus on making art, which has been my literally my life goal for 20 years. You know, it's like literally been all I've wanted to do for 20 years. So I'm I'm really grateful and just so humbled by that opportunity. And it's wonderful. And and so um, I feel like I can finally really express truly what who I am and what what's important to me and in, in concepts and different directions and aesthetics and all of it. So I'm, I'm just, so I haven't really started thinking about legacy yet because I'm still building it. You know, I'm not, I'm not really thinking about, I'm just, but, but now with us, with the sun on the way, you know, you, I think my mind's going to shift and, and it, my whole world is going to change in August. And I, I'm really looking forward to it. Cause I think the meaning of life is literally raising your own children. I think, you know, that those lessons and learnings, I think is, what life is literally all about. Um, and then on the other side, you know, I've yeah. done so much client work that I've just been kind of trained to be a little bit detached, you know, over the last 15 years to just understand what it is. And so I'm finally kind of switching to a little be a little bit more protective, you know, of of the of the work I'm doing and and just kind of figuring out. And honestly, I just talk to Joshua and, and you and Mike and all, all the people who are, are pioneering in the space and just get advice because I clearly need handlers. Um, so, and that's always been the case in everything. I have producers, I have production companies, and now I, you know, I have you guys. <laughs> so it's great. You know, I, I need, I need handlers because I never know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to say that I think I've probably talked to Bradley G Monk more than my wife. So uh, <laughs> that's definitely saying something. <laughs> Appreciate the time, Joshua. <laughs> just just so we're clear, Joshua and Bradley are not in a relationship. And uh... <laughs> okay, can we get that a lower third of that? Put it up there on the screen. I'm excited. It's not early. As of yet. As of yet. We were waiting for it. We were waiting people might, for it. People might consider early. this a relationship yeah. reveal. So just wanted to be I very clear. We're about. talking crypto art. <laughs> See you. What's been What's See been you. the most um, guys kind of like? That. <laughs> What's been the most disappointing part? Like, I really wanted this conversation to feel more like, uh, you know, we're we're in a bar just with our with our mushroom tea here and, you know, our coffee, and we're we're talking like a couple of pals. Didn't want to make it like overly structured. I love that you brought up legacy. That was certainly something I wanted to touch upon, um, just so people kind of understand really about NFTs, right? So now you're able to track this uh, this digital asset on the blockchain there's verifiable proof of ownership there. So there's true provenance you've established. You sell it on the primary market, the artist gets their cut, you know, the platform gets their cut. Typical platform cuts are 15 to 20%. 99% of the platforms in the space take around 15%. There are a couple that are 18 and one or two that are 20, to my knowledge. Then, you know, after holding on to it, someone may decide to put it on the secondary market straight away. That's not an indication that you're a horrible artist. It's more likely, most likely an indication that there's value, right, in your work. And this person sees this as, as an investment and they're looking for a return. Right. So if they purchase the work at 2000, they'll put it on the market for maybe 3,500, right? Depending on how the other sales go, they might decide to put it on the market for like 6,000. What's the case of, of Mike, right? Someone purchased a work for $1, that one dollar work ended up being sold. Was it six point six million dollars, Mike? Was no, that, that was the sixty-six thousand dollar one. Oh, sixty-six thousand. Well, still by that multiple, that's still pretty insane, right? Cool. And so, cool. so in a in a perfect world, right, the world that um, will lead to a greater legacy, the artist would get ten to twenty. Some I've seen like thirty percent um, of that total sale for the secondary market. Right. So 
primary market, bought it for 66,000. Flipped on the secondary market for $6.6 .6 million. That artist is owed 10% of that, of, yeah, of I did that get sale. 10%. Awesome, yeah, the artist is owed 10% 10, 10 of that sale. Also, you know, to that point, the, the collector community is so robust and awesome. This is a wonderful, wonderful community. The digital art community at large, but specifically the crypto art community is a wonderful community. Um, I know personally a lot of collectors that will reach out to the artist and say, yeah. hey, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I sold your work for, yeah. for X amount of money and you're owed the 10%. Um, it didn't reinforce it here in the contract, but I wanted to make sure that you got this 10%. What is your your wallet address or what's yeah. your ETH address? And then they'll send over the money. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that's honestly like the super icing on the cake of this entire thing is really like the there's feels like there's such a like mutual respect between like the collectors, a lot of the collectors at least that I've like talked to that are like, you know, more serious about it and the like artist in terms of like this kind of like patronage and sort of like wanting what is this guy's like fucking rolling a goddamn fucking honey blunt over he's getting what into the, the getting into the big old blunt wait a second i thought which we one it was yesterday of... josh come on <laughs> hold up i thought we just said we're just a bunch of pals like sitting around like, you, know, be <laughs> you caught me off guard it looked like your face was you on fire there's like, <laughs> a goddamn blow towards you out he's got a fucking crack <laughs> You guys are microdosing mushrooms and <laughs> whoa, okay. You love me in with this freaking shit. Goddamn California <laughs> motherfuckers. No. Don't you dare put that poison on me. Don't you put that poison on me. <laughs> Cut to a fucking wide shot. <laughs> mm. I don't even want to I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> FITC, welcome. This is, yeah. this is how we are. This is how we are. We're just hanging out. We talk about things that matter. We talk about, you know, how to help each other move our lives forward, move our practice forward. And this is it. Like we've laughed probably half of this entire presentation <laughs> because we genuinely do talk a lot offline. We genuinely are excited about one another's practice. And if you're new to crypto or if you're new to NFTs and you're wondering like, what? I still don't get it. I can't wrap my, my mind around it. I think the first approach, right, to understanding the NFT space, to understanding, you know, who the various people are is to first, um, you know, get into the community. Don't think that you need to read all the text there is across the internet about NFTs to understand. I think the first fundamental understanding is understanding who we are as a community, right? As as folks excited to to help you win, well, here's right? Another, I think- here Here's another amazing thing that I, that I think, again, that I, I don't think people realize is happening is there are collectors who are collecting your work. And then what are those artists doing? They're taking a portion of their money and turning it back and reinvesting it back in other artists. Like, why are we not talking about a redistribution of wealth among the art community? And, you know, that's going to happen by sitting on these clubhouses and meeting other people. Um, you know, the work that I've, you know, collected uh, is from people, I, I collected one piece from a woman that I didn't even know anything about, but I, I heard her story, you know, and, and, and was, and was compelled to like, yeah, that's something that I want to support and be a part of. And so, you know, it's like, in a lot of ways, and again, it's just because I, I think I'm the old timer here. I mean, this feels a lot like the early 90s, like art scene for the internet. I mean, there was sort of this excitement in this community. And it's so funny because like, sometimes I'm sitting on Clubhouse and I'll hear people come in and be like, oh, everyone's so nice, <laughs> everyone's so nice. And I'm just like, this isn't gonna last. You know, because, just because I went <laughs> through like, the early internet, for the, the early internet, everybody was super nice. And then the trolls came out. So. In a lot of ways, this feels like, you know, when I first got started, like, you know, 25, 26 years ago. And so not only is this community su sort of supporting each other and and guiding each other, but there's also this mass redistribution of wealth, which, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, um, I, I collect with yeah. honor, you know, like it's, it's, it's a it's such an honor to support 
the, the comrades, you know, people we know and have been friends with for decades or, you know, new artists, up and coming artists. It's just so nice to connect with people and support them. And, and it, it definitely is a good psychology to put your mind into the mind of a collector and express your taste in your collection. I'm, I'm very proud of my collections on super rare and foundation. And it's, it's kind of one of the best parts of this whole thing. And diversity. Yeah. We're talking about a, a massive representation of diversity in this space. You know, um, there are, you know, just as many female NFT creators that are killing it right now. Killing it. Yeah. Okay. We've got a lot of people who are a, a people of color that are in the space. We've got a great trans community that's in the space. So not only are we talking about you know, community and excitement, but we're all embracing each other and, and, and that diversity, which, which, what is there more to talk about? Why is there any hate in this, in this thing? I mean, and that, that's another thing maybe we should talk about is a lot of the negativity around NFTs. But when you look at sort of like the greater good that this is doing, I'm even surprised that, that there is a dark side, you know, to, to the NFT space. Uh, I think, I don't know that I would call it a dark side. I think it's one of these things where there's just always room for improvement. There's like, even with like the diversity thing, the ecological thing, it's kind of like, there's definitely room for improvement on the diversity thing. There's definitely room for improvement on the ecological side. And I think if we want to make this something long-term, like, like just kind of, la, 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 those don't exist. Like let's, let's instead like try and like make these things better because I think they are actually I personally believe very solvable problems. And so, and if they're not solvable, whatever, I mean, there's no point not trying to like fucking make it better. So yeah, but, one but, of these things where- but, but Mike, here's my gripe. For somebody who's been in the space for 26 years, you know, I sold posters. I, I sold posters out of my studio. Newsflash, those po posters like were made on computers. They consumed energy. They were printed on paper. Should we talk about where paper comes from? Those posters have to go into tubes. Those tubes have to get shipped from Uline. And guess what? Those are also paper. And then the posters <laughs> go into the tube and then I put it in my car and then I drive it to the post office. And then the post office puts it in another car that then puts it on a plane, flies it over to your country and then puts it on another car to drive it to your goddamn house. <laughs> what yeah, are we talking about ruining the environment? And that's just one poster. That's one poster. So NFTs we're talking, are not ruining the environment. We have to stop no, saying no, no. that. We're it's talking like, about yeah. a new thing that's replacing an old thing. Yeah. And in in my opinion, when you start to look at all the ecological stuff, this new thing, not only is it getting better, but even in its current form, far surpasses me having to send hundreds of $20 posters all over the world. I yeah. could just sit in my studio and sell you one NFT and and break that entire supply chain. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I completely agree. It's one of these things where it's, it's yeah, it, it's in that case, it's absolutely, Happy it's been overblown, right? but <laughs> that doesn't mean there's not like, you know, room for improvement. It's one of these things where it's sort of like, yeah, that's. But that's the nice thing is, is that the, these improvements are happening. It's not oh, like. Oh yeah, everybody's happy. concerned. Like that, that's the thing where it's, it's sort of, especially when, uh, you know, I, I don't see as much the broader blockchain community sort of spearheading this environmental aspects of it as I do the artist community that I, I really am like proud of how like serious everybody's taking that and not just sort of like, which is not surprising because again, everybody's artists and, and, you know, they've got their lion's mane, they've got their what is what's the other thing? I can't even remember that. All the the reishi mushroom and the, the tiger. Reishi mushroom. <laughs> but here's the so thing, it's not yeah. surprising, but it is like, you know, cool to see. Once you start to participate in this community, you start hearing stories about people who run like server farms on geothermal. Like yeah. there are so many opportunities where you can get in touch with people who are doing things that make an even greater impact yeah so it's like it we're talking about a problem but so many solutions exist and so many sure. solutions are in play and so i mean it's just the the unfortunate part is is that um you know the the demonization towards the ecological stuff fell on the artists and 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 for a period i thought maybe we had created a a uh a mental health crisis because there was a lot of people who were getting you know death threats and a lot of negativity 
And even when you tried to say, you know, talk to people and just say, well, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about how things are getting better. Should we be putting pressure on these platforms? We are. And here, like, here's all this, you know, even, even in the midst of all that conversation happening, people believe what they want to believe and, and you're the demon. Yeah, I think that, that to me is more almost like a PSA on social media and just kind of like, you, you got to like, do what you're going to do and sort of block out some of that because you're never going to make everybody happy in terms yeah, of true. stuff like that. There's always going to be somebody who's always something that they don't sort of like, you know, like about whatever. So I, I think it's one of these things. Focus on the improvement that you can do on whatever it is and kind of like block out the other shit. I hey, think, lady, uh, I think <clears throat> can I can I just talk about one frustrating thing that that maybe oh. I would love to hear from 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 you guys? <clears throat> is uh and sorry lady i just i just took the stage from you i'm gonna i'm, <laughs> gonna, I'm gonna moderate for a moment no uh, okay go for it for me i think the biggest thing that i'm having a problem with is the file restrictions so like imagine being a guy that writes software that's we can solve that you know 4k you know video files and uh i've got to squeeze this all into uh in, into a 50 meg you know experience Sucks. You know, I, I sort of struggle with uh with that restriction and i would say i would also counter that you know because that restriction exists a lot of the work that i'm obviously putting in the space is new stuff because i'm like well how do i be creative like forget my old work you know i, I haven't put any of my old work um on the blockchain at all i've only been creating new stuff i mean are you guys at all dude, frustrated right? by the meg. file size limitation it's not 50 meg dude I don't know where you're getting that. that it is on uh, Super Rare. piece was 300. Oh, on Super Rare? 50, uh, yeah. Foundation. Yeah. Uh, which means you got to work in HD, which is boring. You know, we got 5K monitors. You know. Can you bring, you can't bring things on to Super Rare, can you? So the workaround, and it's a 64 gigabyte workaround, um, is to upload it first, um, kind of, as the JSON file itself, and then take the data from that and upload that to Super Rare. That's essentially the workaround. If anybody wants to know specifically- You get another 64 meg, you get just another 14 meg. Well, you get to upload it as is, and it doesn't count the file size as, as being 64 gigabytes. Oh, 64 so you can, so, Right, so what the, oh, so oh, what the actual- Probably enough. Yeah. So yeah, so what people are doing is actually taking the work itself and Directors, going Kyle. through the platform to upload. And there's a workaround where you don't have to upload to the platform first, you can go directly to IPFS. If you go directly to IPFS, you can upload up to 64 gigabytes to IPFS and then take the, the file already uploaded to IPFS at its original right quality wow. and then point that to Super Rare. That's the workaround. That's hmm. crazy. That's yeah, just 64 gigs. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. Like, 50 is, is 50 megs is, is super crazy. There are other platforms out there. I think OpenSea is up to 100 or 150 now. And if you are a photographer or a video um, in the form of movies at all is your thing, then you can use a platform called Ephemera. They allow up to 250 megs. Or you can do the workaround that I've just suggested is upload the file first to IPFS and then point that file. Um, to your super rare account and upload raw or direct from IPFS. Oh, I have homework to do apparently. Yeah, I like I'll help it. You. Hey, I have a, <laughs> I have a, I have a question that maybe I'm thinking about the audience who's watching this, and maybe we should each share one or two things we've learned since being in the space about how to succeed yep. in the space. Maybe people. That's would my like closing it. question, G Monk. Take okay. It should we do it now? You want to do it now? Yeah, um, but I think we're rounding down to, to question time. So yeah, go for it. Okay, I'll go first. I think one thing I've learned is patience. You know, it's just, Damn you gotta that's be what patient. I was gonna say. Ah, oh, shit, sorry. Man. <laughs> sorry, man. Uh, patience, just understanding how to kind of detach a little bit and just release and, and, and then just kind of detach and be patient. Um, promote, but just kind of understand that it takes time and there's weird flows of momentum and, and engagement, and it's just takes time. And, and then the importance of scarcity, 
you know, the importance of scarcity, not releasing too much work, just kind of like really curating properly where it's you're not flooding and it's and it's properly curated, I think are the two things because I you know, you see people going on foundation or wherever, wherever, and they're just releasing eight pieces at once. This is my series. And you're like, whoa, 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 chill. You know, just get, get one, get a sale, do another, get a sale and just like slowly do it. Or if you can do a series, do a series of three or four, two, you know, just kind of break them out a little bit and just really carefully curate it. I think those are the two things that I've, I've learned through my, you know, I've, only been in the space since December. So it's, it's been, you know, three, three and a half, four months. Can you speak to what, how you learned those lessons, Gmo? Um, Through really experienced friends uh, in the space who have been advising me, but also just experience, just doing, do, just going through it and seeing results and understanding, um, and also talking to collectors. You know, I've, I've, I've have a really, really close relationship with a lot of collectors now learning about tokenomics and scarcity and rewarding the collector. What are collectors looking for? Um, I have phone calls with a lot of collectors now and, and they're just, they're partners, you know, they're just, they're friends, they're lovely people. Um, and, and we're just kind of getting in their mindset and, and also starting to collect myself. So I understand kind of just the process and how it feels, you know, how it feels and just, and and what what that what that looks like and feels like I think is really important too. So you know everybody's really friendly. Everyone's talking to each other on Twitter, on Clubhouse, in these forums. And I think it's just important to have open dialogue and just and be an open be an open mind and open heart in the space. Love that. And just really quickly, you mentioned the word tokenomics. Do you want to, in your own words, say what you understand tokenomics to to be in relation to NFTs and crypto art? Yeah, I mean, I go oh man, oh, I eight eight eight, a wonderful collector, uh, kind of kind of got on me a little bit about tokenomics uh, after my last drop, and was really kind of we we talked on the phone, and we were kind of watching it all, and he was just like, okay, this is how it works, tokenomics. Here we go, and he was breaking it down for me, um, and he, basically what he's saying is that it's you got to look at a drop in this case was a nifty gateway drop. He's like, you got to look at it as a whole, you know, you got to look at the whole package and the more work that you have, the more diluted the, the each, each sale is going to be. You're basically going to bring your price floor down. If there's a ton of pieces and the additions that you do, that's also going to bring your price floor down because collectors, you know, they're not going to pay anything over a thousand, 2000. I'm talking nifty gateway kind of drop formats here, but they're not going to pay a certain price for an addition of, 40 or 50 like usually they're not going to do that where if it's going to be a high edition you're going to want a low price and if it's going to be a low edition then your prices come up and one of ones are kind of what everybody wants you know single editions are, are the thing if you're going to do higher editions at least kind of where i'm thinking is editions of five you know editions of 10 maybe tops and then if you want to go higher than that then you price it low you play the secondary market which is what people has been preaching to me for months you know, play the secondary market, price it really low, get it in the secondary market and let those sales, you know, bring the price floor up. So it's a whole, it's a whole system that you have to understand um, based on what collectors want, what collectors find value in. So that was still learning, still, still trying to you know, get it right. But I, I think, you know, you lean on, you lean on your peers and, and your advisors and collectors and, and get all the information you can. Thank yeah, you. I think it's one of these things too. You're never going to really kind of like totally master it because it's always somewhat based on where the market is right now and where things, again, the ebbs and flows of the market and sort of being able to understand that and being able to sort of uh, predict and sort of like see where collectors kind of like mindsets at and where they're sort of like what the market can kind of like bear, I think is a big piece of this. And it's, you know, nobody knows where it's going totally so it's it's and it's out of your control so yeah i honestly agree with like everything gmunk said especially about lessons learned that you know patience scarcity listening to collectors and sort of like you know just taking your time with it 100 percent. mike although it's out of your control per se right how can you find a stable foothold in the space as an artist right not not sort of like buying and selling or making according to the whims of collectors alone 
Yeah, I don't honestly I have no idea how you could find a stable foothold. I think it's one of these things where you you put out the work that you that means the most to you. And, and if it means that you're putting out the work that means the most to you and connects with you on the like deepest level, it, it will connect with other human beings most of the time. Not all the time, but more times than not, if it was something that truly came from like, you know, an honest place in you people can sense that and it's very like innate and they can see that this is like true. And, and, and if you make connections with people, if you make work that connects with people, you'll be fine. That, like, that's all it is. And, and, and you can't control that. So all you can control is just making work. And so making work and sort of having patience with this stuff and, and knowing that it's not going to be easy to be quite honest, the term starving artist that was a term for a reason. This is not going to be easy and, it, and it's going to be something that is a full-time job if you want to make it a full-time job. If you, because who wouldn't want to have this job where you just wake up and make whatever the fuck you want. You just draw a picture and then somebody pays for that picture. Like that's the fucking literally the perfect job. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's like the whole thing. So I, I think, you know, and appreciating that too. If you get any semblance of that, realizing how freaking amazing that is, that like, that is the thing you get to get up and, and do. And like, people are paying money for that. Like, and recognizing that you should be insanely, insanely thankful for that because it is an amazing, amazing privilege. Um, so I, I think, you know, just appreciating this journey and just kind of doing whatever you can to make it better for, you know, everybody along the way. That's, all you can do. Can I can I so, add one real, real yeah. small thing? Um, one other thing that I've learned through the process is just in the four months, I've settled into it. Meaning, you know, when you've been in when you've been a creative professional for so long, you've spent so much time developing your your really specific taste. What what you think you what you qualify as really good art versus you know, art that is not, you know, like there's, there's a scale of quality in your mind as an artist, especially the longer you do it, you have the scale. And the important thing in this space is to let go of that and, and to just kind of understand that it's a different industry entirely and that the collector's taste is very diverse. And so things that blow up, you know, when I first got into the space and I was all confused about it, I've just learned to let go of all of that and accept everything. And I think that's a much healthier way to be in the space because there's a lot of things that don't have explanation and you, you can get angry about it or react to it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't do anybody any good, especially yourself. So it's, it's, it's really good to just open it all up and just, and just be, <laughs> you know, it's very, it's very, it's a very Zen, it's a very Zen approach. I agree with that because, and I think the reason it is, is there's so many different data points. There's so many different people and sort of like money factors and like all different things that you have these weird little sort of anomalies. Honestly, I, I think the Christie's thing is like in a weird anomaly that just kind of like, you know, sort of popped up. I think this is a real, you know, community that has a real amount of value, but I think there is it, weird shit happens. Like you got to just kind of roll with it. You just got to roll with it. So if, if I could, because I, I, I just wanted to answer your thing. Um, one thing that I've gotten into doing is, is you know, not only do I put a piece on uh, as an NFT, but I also offer an extras. So I, I do like a zip that I end up putting up on Dropbox. And I share that with my collectors that might have some renders, you know, some additional renders could be some behind the scenes stuff. And that has been really helpful. A lot of the collectors have just been like, I never expected that I was going to get, you know, the high res version and some alternate videos and some, you know, image renders. So, you know, not only are they purchasing the NFT, but they're sort of purchasing the, uh, the all the behind scenes goodies that I'm going to give them. And that's been really, um, really fantastic. Um, I, unlike these guys, you know, I only have 21 NFTs at the moment and they're all one of ones. Um, I'm a little skeptical about additions. Um, so I've kind of stayed away from those. Um, uh, but also I think it's, it's a, it's a moment to say, you know, how much money do I need to make in order to be happy in order to survive? And so like my last two pieces on super rare, I gifted to two female creators that are in the space, you know, so that I'm using my profile 
again, to shine a light on other creators that are in the space that I think if somebody is coming through me, they can see, oh, you know, who, who are these other, you know, two people that, you know, I've gifted in hopes that they would end up collecting their work in hopes that I blow up and they flip my work for money. <laughs> so there are so many opportunities to, to say, maybe I don't want to sell a piece. Maybe I want to gift some pieces. And so um, I've been gifting. The last thing that I would say, and I kind of stole this from Mike, is, is, is actually be thinking about a fingerprint. And so like in my NFT stuff, one thing I noticed about Mike is, is that I could see his everydays, but when I saw his NFT stuff, he'd always had the stuff at the bottom that was kind of like the, kind of like the certificate of authenticity or the fingerprint. And every time I would see that stuff, I'd be like, oh, this is a Beeple everyday. This is a Beeple NFT because of that branding on the bottom. And so I started doing that and it, it almost has become like a, a, a fingerprint that I think is very valuable that people should be, should be thinking about. Um, Highly valuable. Yeah. And then the last thing that I would say is, is that, um, you know, if you end up getting on multiple platforms, you can use those platforms for different wants and needs. So uh, super rare, I'm collaborating with musicians, you know, during this pandemic, musicians stopped going on tour. So a lot of them have taken a massive hit financially. So the, the ability to sort of ping my network and say, hey, I want to do an audio reactive NFT. I'm going to split everything 50-50 with the, the musicians that I collaborate with. And so, uh, you know, I'm able to then say, I love your music. I love your techno. I love your heavy metal. I love whatever. Here's half of the, you know, proceeds from the sale. So you can also be benefiting musicians who are having a tough time, you know, during this, this pandemic. So super rare has kind of become that kind of work. Well, I'm also on foundation. I'm kind of treating foundation like a sketchbook. So, you know, for me, I found that if you get on multiple platforms, you can try different things in different spaces and, and uh, that can be very, very fun and, and beneficial. I like your techno. Sorry. Like, just, what are you laughing about? I saw that he put up not in a relationship with Chima. Chima thing. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm seeing that now. Not in a relationship. That's lies. I'm <laughs> definitely in a relationship. Oh, right here. You're not, you're not, in, a, <laughs> you're not in a romantic relationship with G Monk. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not in a romantic. We want to be really clear. You said, Joshua, first of all, thank you for that insight, all three of you. I think those are really good points. And um, I wanted to make sure during this FITC, since you all have the years in, I mean, 20 years is a long time. This is your house, this is your stage. Um, I moderate on, you know, Clubhouse at Club Crypto Basel. So if you really want to hear my voice, you can certainly uh, tap in there. But I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to um, be heard and really share your experience and have this not be, you know, over-engineered with a bunch of questions. It comes off as far more authentic and it's from your heart and it's your personal experience. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, just wanted to clear up too that you're not in a romantic relationship with G-Monk because you said earlier that I talk to G-Monk more than I do my wife which naturally raised a few eyebrows. So then people started to think, well, who's the, actually, I'm not going to say what I'm <laughs> But I don't think there's a lot of questions worried, that would arise <laughs> from that. No, but I mean, it's imposter syndrome. I mean, so it's great. Like me and, and, and Bradley can, can gut check each other. Like, you know, it, 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 what, what am I doing? <laughs> D does this feel right? Does this feel right? It doesn't matter how long you've been in this space or how long you've been in this career, you know, I can, and it's funny, the three of you, I've probably talked uh, to the three of you the most out of anybody this entire pandemic, you know, Mike obviously is very busy, but being able to text him saying like, what am I doing? Does it like, does this feel right? Am I doing this right? Talking to collectors, it's okay to say that you don't know what's happening. And you there's so much that. power in saying, I don't know that you get people will go, well, I don't really know either, but here's my experience.